This is Adam. He hasn't given me any uh, fun biographical stuff that you can't read on his slides, so I'm just going to let him get straight to it. Uh, hi. Um, uh, I work for Predator Web. Uh, we're a company that does a lot of site migration and a lot of, uh, yeah, bringing content onto a platform called Plone. Um, some of you are quite familiar with that platform. Um, I don't know what your experience is with, with web development. Are most of you web developers or? Yep. A few. Okay, cool. Well, um, I'm going to talk about Diazo, uh, which is more about templating and the look of your website. Uh, I know in the, in the talk outline there was something about Funnel Web, which is about the content. Uh, I didn't prepare anything about Funnel Web, but we can handle questions with that because Dylan is here and he wrote the thing, so you can ask him. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, firstly, uh, templating. Um, my, I, I, I've been working with web development for a number of years now, and the frustration with templating is huge. Um, I can remember first getting into web development and just doing things like joining strings together and then finding out, oh, why am I so stupid? I'll just go and find a, a framework to do that. And I went through things like uh, Cheetah um, and uh, doing things like this and, and, and patching in strings and things like that. And then now I'm working in Plone and Zoop and working with Zoop templates, which is more XML-ish and it's, it's, yeah, that's nice as well. But uh, the frustration that you find and that I found is you, you, you're a programmer and you think logically and structured and, and you put together your template and then you put it out there and then people just say, oh, it doesn't look good. Can you fix it up and stuff like that? And then you go back and you have to edit your template and you, you end up doing your design in your template, uh, which stuffs everything up and it's costly because you have to recompile and deploy and stuff. So we're going to look at a technology called Diazo which kind of, uh, well, we'll see what it looks like. Um, next slide. So a little bit of history about uh, <coughs> the web development in this area. Um, simplified, it, it's a bit skewed, but it helps to contextualize uh, Diazo. So first you have the, the idea of HTML, and that was good when people just wanted to add a bit of you know, flair to their document, a bit of boldness or, or underline. Um, and in that era, you know, you, it, was, it was fine, it was good to do one document, but as soon as you started to do two or three documents, it started to become uh, cumbersome and you ended up with a problem. CSS came along and it solved all of those issues by separating style from the actual content of your page. So you didn't bold your text anymore, you, you, uh, you, you marked up the text talking about its uh, uh, effect, like it's, you know, it's strong or it has emphasis, things like that. Um, and then along comes programmers and we invent dynamic content, which is much more complex than just having a static files. Most people think in terms of, I've got data in an Excel spreadsheet in a folder on my thumb drive. But dynamic content is quite a bit different. Uh, and when we start to do web development and start to, to uh, um, cooperate with people like web designers, they're thinking in that kind of, uh, you know, stage number two of, oh, there's concrete files in a, in a folder and I'm, I'm working on something that's static. And then when you want to try and, you know, cooperate with web designers, it's quite difficult because, you, you know, do you teach them your entire templating language and how you've set it up just so that they can uh, design your site? Well, when I try and design sites, I'm not really great at it. So it's much better if I can get a web um, designer involved. Uh, so this is what kind of Diazo helps to solve uh, by, it's kind of a middleware solution. So you have your application and it produces the content, uh, but then you have this, this static web page over here uh, on this side here. So your static content and then the con content that's produced by your application or your content management system. And then you have a rules file. And that does, it converts one site to make it look like the other site. And yeah, it does that in, in, in the, the middleware section. So it can compile into XSLT, which is awesome. Uh, Nginx supports XSLT, and so does Apache. Uh, OK. Oh, and the other, other thing you can, you can do it with is you can zip it up into a file, and uh, there's a 
a module called plone.app.theming. So if you're using plone, you can just push that file to, to the site and it already implements it, it compiles it, and you've got a, a theme site. So let's have a look. Demo. How do I exit? Excellent. OK, so uh, I have a plone, that's a pretty web logo. I have a plone site. Um, here's what it looks like in the nude. Make sure my network is working. Yep. And let's say I want to retheme my plone site into the PyConference AU website. So uh, what I can do is I'll go File. Now save this page as a static resource on my disk. I'll create a new folder called PyCon. And I'll call the file theme.html. So that should be working as a file on my system, which it does. Now I, I have my rules file, which is here. I work out how to copy. No. There we are. Zip it up. On there, yep. Then I go back into my plane site. Poor thing. And import. Now, theoretically, There you are. So I have my plane site now themed off that static resource that I um, saved straight off the uh, PyConference uh, website. Now that's, that's pretty powerful because you can just rip any website pretty much. Um, and with Nginx, you could, you could rip a site, compile up XSLT, and then do a proxy pass through XSLT. So you can just take one site and push it through a proxy, and then you've got another a different looking site. This is really good because um, like your your uh, application needs a theme. Um, otherwise, people don't. You know, y y the theme communicates the feeling of your application. And if people feel, oh, this is crap, then even though it's brilliantly built, they'll probably feel it's crap. Uh, <coughs> okay, so let's have a look at our rules file and and see what we can make of it. Uh, slideshow. That's the rules file for that for that particular um, demonstration. Uh, you can see there's there's only three directives. One just tells you which what the name of the file is, and there are just two replace ones here. Usually you can you can bracket directives in in uh, like uh, conditional statements because you don't really want to theme every single page. Uh, things like iframes that are inside a page you don't want to theme that. Uh, Ajax requests, you don't want to theme that. So usually you look for a, a, uh, a tag or some kind of feature that's in themed pages that you use uh, to do the rules. Uh, let's have a look at creating a rule. Um, oh yeah, so that's, that's just an example of some of the, uh, the rules you can use. Um, it's pretty standard stuff, it's pretty simple. It, it takes these rules and then it creates the XSLT for them. Uh, drop just drops stuff in the in the template. After puts it after um, a, a particular tag and you, likewise before and merge you can uh, that takes attributes and merges them in. Okay. Select. Okay, let's create a rule. So um, if I exit the slideshow. Um, Now, 
Firebug is your friend. And when you go into Firebug, uh, you can do the little pointer thing. And select. say if we wanted to remove this section from our, our rules, because, well, that's not relevant to our site anymore, we can select that bit there and then look at the HTML and find the element that we want to remove, like that one there, and then copy XPath and back here. Paste it in there. And we can press it again. <coughs> so most rules will take a just two arguments. One will be an argument talking about the uh, the theme page, and the other argument will be talking about the content. And so a replace will replace an element in the, in the theme page, or a drop one will drop an element in the theme page. Uh, here we're doing a drop. I think I may have actually stuffed that up because I didn't remove the comments. Oh, that didn't work. But you get the idea. I'm sorry. I'm not going to try it again. But essentially, you can do that. I, I, I probably didn't save it properly or something like that. But um, yeah, that's, that's how you can create a rule. Uh, let's go back to the, where is my PowerPoint? Yeah, OK, uh, I already said this. So uh, pretty much you can, you can use this as a module uh, in Plone or as an in-between sandwich kind of middleware uh, passing through your application. Great when you have like one major content management system, and then you have this adjunct application on the side that you need to theme and keep consistent with the rest of the, the system. The other thing that uh, is, is probably worth mentioning is that rules, that theme directive, where you specify, oh, uh, this, is, this is the theme to use, you can actually put a web address in there as well. So it doesn't actually need to have a static site with the rules file. You can just pull any site off the web um, using just a single rules file. Um, questions? Um, so you said it's all, is that coming through on, there we go. Um, it's, sort of XSLT and XML based. Yes. Uh, how does that play with the variety of badly formed documents that you might find out and about on the web? Um, not too well. <laughs> once, however, once, once you have uh, like the theme, the theme part of the site, uh, because it's a static resource, you, you can manipulate it a little bit. And once you are able to compile it, that's, that's fine, it's compiled. Uh, in terms of the data coming out of your application or your content management, uh, yeah, it needs to be reasonably well formed. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I broke it this morning, <laughs> but uh, it's it's yeah. Um, you know, I suppose you could add a add a pass to try and clean it up with something else as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, the, the example um, the example we're using there is is 
was using the PyCon site. Generally, the most common use case is you're going to take a site that's been developed in HTML from a designer. So there's people that you can control to some extent and say, deliver me HTML that is compliant. Uh, and the whole idea is that then they can go and change it later, but remain and keep it compliant. The whole idea of sort of pulling a, a one, ripping it off another site, probably a less common use case. Yeah, but a fun gimmick for uh, advertising the tool. <laughs> Questions from anyone else? So I have two questions. Sure, yeah. Um, the first thing is you've got a module for Plone. I don't know much about Plone, but okay, I assume yeah. it's saying which goes into Plone and is integrates well, and from what I saw, it lets you upload it via mm. the web, yeah? Yep. Okay, and you've got things for web servers. Mm. Have you also got something which just is plain whiskey middleware? Um, I don't know of any. Uh, I had thought of the same thing and thought, oh, can I rip apart plone.app.theming and, and, and have a similar kind of facility in, in my own application? Um, it's, yeah. Um, there is. Um, there's an interesting history there. Um, so the, the original idea uh, was, I think, from a guy called Jim Fulton, and it was originally called Deliverance, and there were two implementations of it. There was the Deliverance, which was Whiskey uh, Middleware, uh, and then there's the Diazo implementation, which originally was called XDB. Um, so Deliverance still exists. It doesn't use XSLT. Um, it uses kind of a Python implementation and runs as middleware. Um, I'm not. I'm pretty sure there must be a Whiskey Middleware version of Diazo, but I'm not yeah, sure. I'm sure there is. Yeah. Um, the XSLT bit is, is kind of interesting because um, there's so many XSLT parsers and um, no one really wants to write XSLT, but a lot of people have written it uh, and it runs really fast. A lot That seems like an expensive thing to do, what was done up there, but it actually runs really fast. Um, particularly if you use you know the, the library-based stuff, mm. um, which is all written in C. So. And uh, the, the Diazo rules file does allow you to inject little snippets of XSLT. So if you had like a corner case where, oh, I can't use a rule for here, you can actually put XSLT there. Um, I guess one of the interesting things for us is that, um, you know, we're a web development company, so uh, developing themes and getting things themed fast was, you know, this has actually dropped the amount of time it took uh, to develop sites quite dramatically. Um, and in particular, um, like one of the use cases behind, that we're originally going to talk about in this talk, or Adam was going to talk about in this talk, was that um, of site conversions. So uh, one of the sites we did, you know, they didn't want a new theme, they just wanted exactly the same site. The original site was written in Team Site or something, uh, which cost an obscene amount of money. We replaced it with a Plone site that looked exactly the same. And what we did is we just took the HTML, the CSS, we themed it using Diazo, didn't take very long, we plugged all the Plone stuff in, and the second part of it, uh, which is, if you're interested, is the funnel web part, where it's basically a web crawler hooked up to a framework called Transmogrifier, which is kind of a pipeline which transforms uh, content or objects, and that goes all the way through, and we ran that, crawled the site, pulled all the content, and, and uploaded it into Plone. So those two processes, uh, you know, we literally had a site that looked exactly the same, had the same kind of compliance with regard to the HTML, uh, and had all the same content uh, within a day or two. Um, and that's a huge efficiency for, you know, developing websites. Um, and it's a good sales thing. You know, people, one of the problems with uh, developing websites is that people don't quite expect that they can't reuse their HTML. They can't, we've got a site designed already, it should be cheaper. And anyone who's done anything with web frameworks knows that you've, it actually has cost us more in the past to pull apart an existing theme and put it back together inside a framework. Uh, and this, this solves that problem. Yeah. If, oh, yeah. So can you just explain how the, when you're running it in the middleware yep. configuration, 
how that actually works. So the, the request goes through to the the, web, the Plone website or whatever is, is behind there. The HT, that page, the generated page comes back and then that gets transformed at the server, is that right? Or how does that work? Uh, in, in a Plone situation or in uh, just a generic situation? Because the Plone actually integrates Diazo straight into its in, into its. So let's say you don't code. have a plain site behind yeah. it. You can run it just as a uh, a layer to the theme up that site in line. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So with something like Nginx, you can proxy another site through Nginx, and then have XSLT style sheets in Nginx. So it does uh, like the request comes into Nginx, it uh, proxies it, gets gets pulls the content from another place runs the style sheets, and then produces or returns the output back. Um, does that answer your question? I or? think so, yeah. Yeah. So in, in that case, you actually need to compile the rules file into XSLT. Um, yeah, in addition, um, so with regards to the, um, the middleware side of things, mm. um, so I did uh, some playing around with this before, and um, like you were asking about uh, whiskey middleware and that sort of thing, um, I did set it up so that you can use um, XDV. Uh, that's what it was called, uh, now Diazo, as um, as middleware within um, within your whiskey stack. Um, so yeah, so you can just have that happen um, as part of it there, as part of that process, and use that there. I think um, I thought it's actually a part of a module um, within XDV. Uh, sorry, uh, Diazo. Um, I thought it's actually built into it, into that package itself, um, if I'm not mistaken. But I could be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in this, the actual um, whiskey middleware layer was actually in there already. Uh, I thought. Yeah, or otherwise, I'm not an expert on whiskey, but... Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Otherwise, it was a separate package anyway. But, um, yeah, it is there, and I have used it before, so it can be done. Yeah. Cool. If you have questions on funnel web, Dylan will answer them. Sure. Well, we've got a... I think we've got about 15 minutes left before the break, if you want to have a bit of a chat about funnel web or... Anything like Do you that? want to talk about Funnel Web at all, or um, we already mentioned a few things? You don't have so, to. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Are, are you designing a site at the moment with, or trying to migrate a site at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think what I could talk about. Um, so, if you can, you pull up the transmogrifier. Um, Thing. The like just okay. the PyP page. Oh sure, yeah. Um, so so FunnelWeb is, is built on um, Transmogrifier, um, and Transmogrifier has this idea that you have different sort of uh, filters. It calls them blueprints, and you combine them together into a pipeline. And it has a set of basic um, steps, uh, blueprints that you can use. Um, that will essentially what gets passed along the pipeline is a dictionary. Um, so you have these items, which are each dictionaries that can contain different fields. Um, I've got no idea how you spell it. Trans, you don't read Calvin or Hobbes then. Um, I E R. Yeah, there it is. That's no, that's here. without the uh, transmography, transmogrifier. What are you putting? Yep. Next one down without the pH, with an F. No pH. Just with an F. Did I get it? Um, so it's it's kind of this very basic concept. Um, it, it uses iterators, um, and what it does is it connects one iterator against the next iterator. Um, see a little bit of code to look at. So, so the way Transmogrifier works is it has this pipeline definition. So you can see that the pipeline definition at the, fr the front says, you know, which sections to run. And then each of these sections has a blueprint. And each of these blueprints is, is created by a package or a piece of Python code that defines what happens. Then you can give it um, configuration options. Uh, so what are we doing here? We've got, can't even see that. They're just examples, they're not. Oh, example source. So you have a source at the beginning of some kind. So the, the pipeline 
what you get with FunnelWeb is you get a default pipeline. So generally you're kind of overriding a few settings, but you're not changing the pipeline much itself. So the source that we're using for FunnelWeb is a web crawler. And it has a bunch of configurations like what website you pointed at, um, how, what depth to go to, what URLs to ignore, et cetera, et cetera. But the source will essentially just crawl the whole site and pull in those things into these items, which are dictionaries, and pass them along the pipeline. Uh, so maybe some examples of different like components that you can put in? Yep. If we have a look at um, Um, so the next stage of the, the, the funnel web pipelines, it does um, matching of uh, MIME types and tries to determine uh, what, what likely object type you're going to want in the final system. Um, then it does uh, what I call like a detemplating um, step. So it uses XPath rules to try and, in a similar way to Diazo does, it uses rules to try and extract out what's the content and get rid of all the, the templating stuff which you don't want. You want things like what the title is, what the description is, maybe an update date, the body of it, and so on. Uh, and you can do things like create rules that delete bits of the content. So if there's a, a piece of content in the middle of your main body bit which you want into the CMS or the product, then you can drop that bit. Um, here's how, uh, everything, how you run it. So here we go. Here's the kind of different steps it goes through. So you have templates. You can have up to four templates. You can modify the pipeline if you want to add more. Um, if any of the rules, like any of the XPath rules in the templates don't match, it will go to the next template and try ex using that instead. Um, then it goes through a whole lot of site analysis, um, which you may can turn on or turn off. Um, so they do various different things. Oh, before I get to that, there's an auto template thing, which is really interesting. It kind of works sometimes. You can give it a go. What it does is actually use this algorithm that I found implemented in Python somewhere on the web. And it does cluster analysis on all the different pages and tries to guess what the titles and what the descriptions and what the body is. Um, it's kind of cool. It's written um, mainly for news sites. So you can point it at any particular uh, um, thing that is roughly like a news site, and it tries to guess what the XPaths are. Um, so if you can run that whole thing, does a cluster analysis, pulls out the content, and see what the content is that comes out the other end. Um, so the index guess, uh, that's trying to work out whether things like an index HTML. It does a little bit of a link analysis to see if things are kind of pointed, what's pointed at what. Um, title guess is trying to uh, look at things like the uh, the link text uh, to see if that creates a better title than what the title tags have, etc. Um, the attachment guess is uh, uh, depending on how your CMS works, you may want your uh, your images in the same folder or closely associated with it. So what it'll do is it'll try and move things like images associated with a show HTML and stick them in the same folder. Um, the hide guess, that's, uh, what that does is it tries to uh, work out things that, I'm trying to remember what that does. I think it, um, it's trying to work out stuff that you know shouldn't be displayed in the navigation, but still should be converted. Um, so you add folders. Um, you know sometimes you won't have a particular item that represents a folder, so it'll go and add folders in the hierarchy to make sure that everything and they're all sorted in order, so that the when you finally get to the bit that creates stuff at the end, it will add things folders before the contents in the folders. Um, change type gives you the option of sort of setting what the content types are. Um, and this is the clone uploading stuff. So this is kind of, you know, because it's a pipeline, you can go and override that pipeline if you want uh, and pull out all the clone stuff and stick in something else that will upload it into something else. You can, you know, there's, there's blueprints out there for doing CSV dumps or 
creating XML or doing all sorts of things. Um, uh, so you can, you know, you could create something that'll that'll use SQL Alchemy and create and upload that all into a relational database and maybe hook it up to uh, Django or something like that. Um, so it has this whole kind of command line stuff. So you can override a lot of things in the command line itself. Um, so you don't have to um, go and create your own blueprint file. Um, so there you can see some of the options we've got. You know, crawler maximum number of things crawled would be 50, and we're going to upload it into that particular site. Um, it does caching, which is kind of nice, um, so that you know if you run a big crawl over a site, um, it will store it all locally. Um, it does things like pull that out of the cache so that everything's not pulled into memory as it's doing the full crawl. Um, So that's examples. Uh, this stuff here with the recipe, that's, um, it has a build out um, recipe. So you can configure it within build out. Um, if you don't know what build out is, um, come to my talk tomorrow about build out and why it's an excellent thing to, to um, configure and, and join together applications. Um, and that's more or less it. There's an example of the template rules. So we're saying, you know, template one title is a text. Um, something uh, one thing we've done recently is we've we've moved out a lot of the the command line stuff and things like that into another tool called Mr. Migrator, and that also has a um, Plone UI part to it. So you can install that in Plone, um, type these things into a web form like the the templates, let it run, and import the stuff directly into that folder into Plone, so you don't have to run it from a command line. Is there any questions about that? There's the uh, output of the template auto. So you, what you, what you, the way you most want to do that is run it in debug mode, so it outputs so you can see what all the, the different X paths are, and then you can feed that back into the normal templating mechanism. Um, you can let it run if you want, but if you've got a big site, the cluster analysis tends to take quite a bit of time. How much does it look at for that? Like how many pages it it, it'll try and look at all of them. Okay. It'll look at all of them, analyze them, and then try and put them into clusters and say, these pages roughly look the same, and here's the things with titles, and here's the things, here's where the titles are, here's where the descriptions are. So you can see it says, you know, divides up into title, main, main bit of content. Uh, yep. Okay, cool.